Who's making waves in the South China Sea? China, the Philippines, or the U.S.? Once again, some uninhabited reef in the South China Sea becomes flashpoint in the press. China is blamed for bullying its small neighbor, encroaching on international freedom of navigation and being unrestrained, among others. A CNN reporter even happened to be on site, making a case against China to the global audience. So let's dive into it today. The reef called Rengai Jiao by China, or Second Thomas Shell in English, is at the center of the dispute. It's not just your nondescript reef lost in the middle of the sea, but one with a Filipino warship grounded on it for 25 years. Over the past year, the waters became choppier and skirmishes have been erupting much more frequently in the vicinities. What are the facts? What are fantasies? Who is the agent provocateur? Welcome to this special edition of The Point with me, Li Xin, coming to you live from Beijing. I'm pleased to be joined from Haikou, southernmost China's province of Hainan, by Yang Yan, director of the Research Center of Oceans Law and Policy at the National Institute for South China Sea Studies. Here in the studio, Ina Tangen, senior fellow at Taiha Institute from Washington, D.C., Klaus Laris, a fellow at the Uju Wilson Center, and the Richard M. Krasnell, Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Last but not least, from Manila, the Philippines, by Herman Tio Laurel, President of a Manila-based think tank, Asian Century Philippines Strategic Studies Institute. Uh, the warmest welcome to all of you, everyone. Now, um, Aina, let me go to you first. In March alone, the there have been two clashes be or confrontations between Chinese and Filipino vessels near the Rengai Jiao. We all saw the footage. So what happened in a nutshell? Well, uh, the Philippines is uh, intent on making sure that this is an issue. And uh, that seems to be much more for domestic politics, but also uh, trying to get more bases and support from the United States. The question is, uh, is security more important against China, which has not started a war, or is um, you know, economics. When uh, the Philippines it appears to be doing very well last year, projected to do very well this year, why are they uh, doing this? And many people are asking the same questions. Why is this a priority when you have a country with one of the worst Gini indexes, the disparities between rich and poor uh, in the ASEAN uh, grouping? So basically, we were seeing a Filipino ship bumping into Chinese vessel there. But we'll get to the technical, the details on the sea later. But uh, here is how China has been responding. On March the 24th, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs says China is willing to properly resolve disputes through dialogue and negotiation with the Philippines. However, the Philippines, acting in bad faith, has attempted to illegally send construction materials to its so-called grounded military vessel on Rengai Reef to reinforce it into permanent facilities, China will by no means sit idly by. Yang Yang, let me uh, go to uh, you, for Yang Yan, Yang Yan, sorry, let me go to you. For, what is all about um, this vessel that's been grounded? You don't see in the footages on the press so much. Yes, actually, I think the fundamental reason why it is happening, what is happening recently is the Philippines, uh, the Marcos government is trying to change the status quo in the, in the South China Sea by making the ship BRP of uh, Sierra Mandra a permanent occupation on the second Thomas Shaw um, by sending those, all those uh, construction ma materials. So this is the, something that um, I think is the, trying to change. So the how come the ship? Quo. Yeah, how come the ship was grounded? on the Rengai Reef 20, 25 years ago in 1999. Could you just very briefly give us the background there? Yes, 25 years ago, the ship was grounded on Rengai Reef with the excuse of a mechanical fault. And then the president uh, promised, the then president promised to tow the ship away, but yet it's still there 25 was years it a, later. Was it an accident? Was it accident or was it intentional? Did anybody know? I personally think it's intentional um, with the, the excuse of a mechanical fault. But what's the point? What has been the explanation from the Filipino side about this ship having an accident or did they ever deny that it was intentional? Well, to me, I think they're back then they were trying to occupy more inhabited features in the South China Sea and trying to uh, make a new status quo by occupying the second Thomas Shaw. All right, let's, let's get the Filipino perspective. Uh, Mr. Herman Tio Loro, what has been your knowledge of uh, 
the story about this ship that that is causing that is the excuse of all all the drama that's been unfolding over the 25 years what's the filipino story well first uh, thing that is very important to keep in mind is that we have had uh, peace and quiet in relation to this uh, ayungin shoal called in the philippines or second thomas shoal for the past 25 years uh, and all this trouble started only in 2023 when the Americans introduced a project called Project Mushu, which is intended, they say, to exact uh, reputational cost on China by uh, what they call assertive transparency, meaning propaganda. Now, I, I was a confidant of the president of the Philippines at that time, 1999, to uh, the rest of the decade of the first uh, 2000s. And uh, I personally know that, uh, and uh, President Estrada at that time confided in me that he did commit to pull the ship out. And that was grounded in order to have a claim on that uh, area. So this is confirmed by many other testimonies. And uh, there was a debate at that time between uh, some hawkish faction of the um, Philippine government represented by the defense secretary, then secretary or Orly Mercado, and the foreign uh, secretary at that time, Domingo Chiazon, the late Domingo Chiazon, who was more dovish. Uh, but President Estrada himself was very friendly to President Chiang Jemin of that time, at the time. Mm. And uh, he told me that he was getting a lot of loans from President Chiang Jemin. Uh, and uh, he did commit to pull it out, uh, but uh, he says it's a strategy to uh, for the Philippines to have an anchor in in the area. Mm. The, so, Mr. Laurel, did the, the Philippines never had a territorial claim over the Rengai Jiao in the past until they changed their discourse over the in the in the early 2000s? What happened? Because according to international treaties, such as treaties of uh, Washington, treaties of Paris, or, or a treaty between the UK and the US concerning the Philippines territory, the Rengai Jiao is clearly outside their territory. Well, what the Philippines today is uh, getting, getting confused about, and it's uh, even the Philippine position is not very clear because, uh, of course, what they are claiming is uh, EEZ, uh, an exclusive economic zone based on the UNCLOS. However, mm -hmm. even that does not apply because uh, as the uh, uh, arbitration panel uh, discussed, uh, the BRP Sierra Madre is a military ship. It's a naval ship it disqualifies it for consideration under UNCLOS because a militarized situation can be cannot be resolved through UNCLOS. Mm. So it's a special case. And the, even uh, the uh, ARC uh, advocate of the claim of the Philippines over that area, uh, Justice Scarpio, has withdrawn his position that uh, this uh, RBRP share matter can be used as an anchor for a claim. Hmm. Um, Professor Laris, let me bring, in, bring you in there. Um, you see in the American press, for instance, that this is all about obstruction of uh, navigation freedom, but they don't tell you a story about the, the ship grounded there as an anchor uh, in the Philippine perspective for that piece of uh, territory there. Well, I wouldn't make such a fuss about the actual ship, and let me just Why not? If I may correct my the you speak, uh, uh, there were actually serious tension in, uh, in the South China Sea and around the second Thomas Shoal in 2014, also in 2021 and 22. It didn't all start in 2023. And we all know that the UN Permanent Court of Arbitration in 2016 said that the second Thomas Shoal is in the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. So it is sovereign Philippine territory. And if they wish to ground a ship there, they can do so. And they want to resupply the 12 or so soldiers on that ship every two or three weeks. And that is a problem that Chinese vessels do want to block that resupply of the ship. I think the reading in uh, China and the Western world and the Philippines is very, very different. But I think there is room for improvement here and we should not uh, try to escalate the situation but de-escalate the situation. We are talking about the resupply of uh, a former ship which is actually grounded, which cannot do anything. And is it really necessary to have a world crisis about the resupply of 12 soldiers on a, uh, on a semi-submerged reef in the South China Sea. I think this should not lead to an international crisis. Even there is talk of war about that. 
And I think this is despicable. We should not be talking about war in the South China Sea when we talk about a submerged reef. And if I may that, there are rumors, and of course I don't know whether these rumors are correct, but there are rumors that the former US um, uh, Chinese ambassador to the US has said that China wants to take the second Thomas Shoal. I don't know if that is correct, but there are rumors in the press. And if that is correct, I think this is totally unacceptable. Okay. No one right. should take that ship or that ship. I have to correct uh, the speaker. Know, it should, okay, uh, it should okay. Laurel, Laurel, has, Laurel wants to say something. Sorry, yes. um, Mr. Well, Carr. Well, the, the previous speaker is uh, erroneous in saying that uh, there is so the uh, the Philippines is sovereign is sovereign in an EEZ uh, exclusive economic zone does not provide uh, does, does not extend sovereignty it only uh, provides uh, sovereign rights so even in that case uh, the speaker is uh, in error number two in the 25 years that is over 8,500 days uh, the speaker spoke of two or three incidents that is uh, insignificant. But what happened after February 2023 was almost weekly incidents. Uh, this was deliberate and a strategy of the Americans, as I said, what they called assertive transparency, which is to create a situation using provocations from the Philippine Coast Guard. Uh, so uh, it is very clear it is a strategy of the Americans to provoke tension and conflict in Asia. Mr. Laris, you Can want I to just reply? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we all know that China has the largest Coast Guard in the world. The Philippines is a much smaller country with a much smaller Coast Guard. It doesn't have the military capacity to provoke. It is clearly that the larger country, the larger military, the larger Coast Guard is doing the provocation here. I think the Philippines is the underdog on this occasion. And I think we should try to de-escalate the situation rather than letting it spin okay, out um, of control. Yeah, You're Klaus, right. you have, you have made... About Mm -hmm. you, you have made a point that's that's uh, on the mind of a lot of people, mm -hmm. basically saying because China's size is bigger, so China is the bad guy here. I want to bring in Aina here. How do you react to that? Because we hear that argument all the time. It's like because of the size of China, it shouldn't do anything. Is that the case? or? Oh, these are State Department talk points. Uh, they're trying to say, oh, look, China's uh, ganging up on little uh, Philippines. But when, in fact, and I, uh, even my uh, colleague in Washington would have to admit that the, the U.S. is trying to provoke this. They're trying to have a situation where they can have another proxy war, tension, conflict, whatever you want to call it, which is aimed at derailing uh, Chinese uh, economic efforts. I mean, ASEAN has been a bright spot uh, for, for trade. It is now the number one. The Philippines has benefited from that. And what, what do you see the U.S. doing? Trying to separate it, trying to uh, find willing proxies who are willing to do this. You know, my, my colleague in Washington also forgot to, uh, to uh, point out that this is completely illegal under international law. You, you cannot just sail ships onto shoals and claim them. This is an area which is claimed by five different uh, countries. So this idea that somehow this is Philippines versus China is nonsense. All right. This was an illegal act, and it continues to be one. And it's a provocation that is being, uh, you know, puffed out by Washington in its desire to forestall um, contain China. Yeah, Ms. Yen, um, over the past, no, over the past, just a moment, over the past, how did the two countries manage the situation? Because this has been going on for 25 years, and yet it seemed that the two sides had a way of managing their differences. And what changed under? President Marcos, Junior. Yes, I think that in the past we do have uh, many communication channels like the BCM, the bilateral consultative mechanism. And also I think the, of the two sides, China and the Philippines has a, a, a gentleman's deal, deal. That's why the ship can stay there for the past 25 years because China, uh, well, well, if they, it is uh, for humanitarian reasons to send the food and waters, the China is okay with that, but not the construction material and is trying to change the status quo. At one point, how I do we know for sure? Before, how do we know for sure that these are construction materials uh, because we can see it you know it's all on their ship it's all on the uh, on the uh, supply ship it, it's very clearly to be seen on this on the scene and also I think one point that haven't been mentioned before is the President Marcos is a very interesting person we've talked a lot about the United States but I think President Marcos is a very ambitious person he wanted to uh, leverage the big power competition and wanted to gain more defense budget from the uh, 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 extra regional countries like the US Japan and Australia 
So I think this is a very important point to uh, mention. All right, let, let's take a look at... Yeah, uh, Mr. Loro, I, I will... I, I will have to add several points. Yeah, yeah, just a moment. I, just a moment. I have a, I have a timeline to give and, I give, you, and I give you the chance to speak right after that. So basically, mm -hmm. let's take a look at what's been happening since um, the beginning of last year. For instance, in February 20, last year, the Philippines decided it will give the U.S. access to four military bases in the Philippines, that bringing the total number to nine. In September last year, Washington and Manila conducted a joint bilateral sale through parts of the South China Sea from November last year to February this year, both navies, I mean the U.S. and the Philippines, conducted what they call maritime cooperative activity on three occasions in the South China Sea. In late February this year, President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. told the press after his speech at the Australian Parliament that he expects Canberra to stand alongside the Philippines in the South China, uh, in the South China Sea against China. Early March, Australia announced some 190 million US dollars in funding for ASEAN projects in areas including maritime security. And it was reported days ago that the US, the Philippines, and Japan would launch joint naval patrols in the South China Sea later this year. It's part of a package, as reported, a package of initiatives the three countries will unveil at their first ever trilateral summit this month. So, Mr. Laurel, um, what is it that you wanted to tell us? Well, uh, we have evidence, of course, that there is a clear gentleman's agreement in a 2014 report or several reports from 2014. Uh, then Defense Secretary Voltaire Gasmin admitted to the press uh, quite clearly that he had a uh, talk with uh, uh, Ambassador Ma Keqing of China at that time, that uh, he is reiterating that the commitment to deliver only uh, food and uh, humanitarian supplies is what is agreed upon. And he says that definitely the Philippines will not be delivering construction materials. The second point I had to, I have to make is that there is a U.S. Uh, military website, uh, War Zone, with an article in uh, February, around February or March last year, which announces uh, that the U.S. needs to uh, establish the combined operating base Sierra Madre in that very same spot. So it is very clear that it is an American uh, plot to advance its uh, uh, war in Asia, which, uh, by the way, our uh, one of our military analyst, General Victor Corpus, has said the aim of the U.S. in the pivot to Asia is to create uh, tension and war in the region, not to win, because the U.S. cannot win against China in Asia, but to depress the uh, Asian economy and Chinese economy by at least 30% decline of its GDP. The same thing that the U.S. is doing to the European Union today and Germany. So I think it is very naive for the other party a while ago to say that the, uh, the this is the China bullying. In fact, China's massive Navy and Coast Guard and uh, volunteer militia, uh, maritime militia, is an advantage because it does not have to use lethal force. It uses uh, tactics and strategies to uh, blockade the, the delivery of construction materials that the Americans want mm. okay. to use to repair the yeah. BRP Sierra Madre. Okay. Uh, Mr. Laris, you want to chip in here? Yeah, I mean, um, this is all not very convincing. You know, this is really thinking in conspiracy terms. If there's an article in a military newspaper, that doesn't, of course, mean that the U.S. government is behind it. I can see no reason why the U.S. government wants to provoke instability in the South China Sea. You're the United me. States has a dense <laughs> full trade and Gaza, it is not interested in having another crisis on its hands. And the reason why there is close cooperation with the Philippines, Australia, and other countries, Japan and South Korea, uh, is of course that they all fear China, that China's action and China's assertive, to put it mildly, assertive behavior in the South China Sea, and it claims to 90% of the South China Sea, has really intimidated other countries. Um, so I, I will ask the speaker, why, why is ASEAN, why why are why is ASEAN not supporting the Syria Philippines? The reading in China and in the Western world is very, very different. And, uh, you know, there's no point to, to, to really talk about that. So, Mr. Laris, so much. Professor Laris, why is, is the U.S. why is the U.S. so active in reestablishing its military presence in the Philippines? If the U.S. Well, is not interested in provoking, stirring up trouble, why does it does it acquire for more access having, to... Having a few bases... No, that's a, fair, that's a fair question. Having a few bases in the Philippines doesn't mean you 
create instability. China has a military base in Djibouti. No one claims that China is creating instability in Djibouti. Having military bases doesn't mean you are creating instability. 400 military you bases? You're kidding yes. me. How can yes. you say this kind yes. of nonsense? But no, yeah, I, this no, is incredible. Say, there have been why, innumerable why white papers line? put out by the Defense world. Department identifying that they want to engage China in uh, the Asiatic uh, regions, uh, and you, you're, you're just simply denying reality. Now, I know this is very popular no, in Washington I, 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 to have a counter-narrative that just says, oh, no, we're not doing anything. The fact and is, the very, U.S. has yeah. declared their intention time and time again, and you pretending is less than uh, honest and it's it's really very unfortunate are for you, the philippines because saying, because the philippines today the United okay, is, uh, mr laura mr laura please mr laura you go ahead yeah, yeah. you wanted to say and uh, the situation is very unfortunate for the philippines which was united under president duterte uh, for uh, the independent foreign policy and asean of course i have to mention uh, and the philippines had been working to very well together for prosperity and peace in the region until 2023 let us make that distinction when uh, uh, BBM, Bongbong Marcos, started approving all these military bases. This is part of the Asia private that which has been uh, in the works for the past uh, decade and a half. Uh, so this is a strategic move of the U.S. Now, as I said, it is we are thankful China is ex employing non-lethal means in controlling the situation, and that is possible because of its size. But the Philippines and the U.S. are trying to use this victim card how uh, the Philippines, a small uh, uh, David versus the giant Goliath. No, China has been using very peaceful means, and uh, the malice is really coming from the Bongbong government. Even the presidential sister, the sister of Bongbong Marcos, I mean, Senator Aimee mean Marcos, has been contradicting the president on these issues. So we are getting divided, we are getting distracted from economic development. Uh, uh, investments are coming down to zero now. They're expecting the Americans to come in, but uh, the uh, recent trade mission did not deliver anything. All right. Ms. Yen Yen, um, if you want to jump in there, that's fine. And there's uh, much talk of uh, invoking a mutual defense treaty that's signed in the 1950s between the Philippines and the United States. The U.S. Secretary of State, the uh, uh, Indo, so-called Indo-PACOM uh, leader, Admiral John Aquilino, and the U.S. Defense Secretary have all talked about the possibility of invoking the so-called mutual defense treaty. Um, what is the U.S. doing by constantly reiterating their so-called ironclad commitment to such a treaty. Is that treaty um, applicable here? Well, actually, first of all, I don't think that the United States is ready to go to a, a maritime conflict with China for the Philippines, even though it's, it's an ally. But I think the United States is uh, is happy to see there is a, this dispute and this, uh, uh, this skirmishes between China and the Philippines because it can drag China down. And then secondly, about the MDT, I think the United States has been very cautious to make uh, the Philippines a commitment of whether uh, this uh, arm attack on the uh, on the vessels, aircrafts, and public vessels is uh, equals to the uh, arm attack on the ter island territories in the South China Sea. Well, they never make very accurate commitment uh, given the, the MDT Article Four. And also, secondly, the United States didn't say that whether the using of a water cannon by the China Coast Guard is uh, equals to an arm attack to the Philippines. So these two things, I think is very important, which uh, by, by that, I mean that that's my personal thinking that the United States doesn't want to go to a conflict with but China. It's making, but it's making a lot of noise. It's posturing about, you know, we are going to stand next to the Philippines up against China. And they have, you have the uh, the press, you know, making a big show yes. about China being the bully. What yes. is going on here? Is there some kind of, not, not conspiracy, I wouldn't say conspiracy, but obviously, they, there's a strategy here. What are they trying to achieve, according to you? I think the President Marcos is giving a pressure on the United States, trying to uh, make it a, make its uh, a ally, making more uh, detailed commitment to the Philippines. And the United States also wanted to see China is distracting by uh, by our uh, um, maritime disputes with our neighboring countries. Well, it's definitely uh, the United States' interest to see that um, to maintain its own um, 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 uh, priority, you know, in the region. Okay. Um, well, that's that's true. But I think the United States is. Uh, 
uh, although orally they make many commitments, they say uh, they will help the Philippines to go against China. But so far, we didn't see uh, much physical, you know, actions. Mm. Uh, um, Mr. Laris, I'm going to give you the opportunity, but keep it short, please. If the U.S. is really um, you know, interested in seeing peace in the South China Sea, shouldn't it try to con um, constrain or, you know, talk to the Philippines and China and sit down and talk to each other instead of sending more military vessels involved in more military exercises in the region? The United States is not interested in peace in there. any part of the world. As we have seen, they have they had uh, conducted invasions in Asia, the Eurasian continent, uh, everywhere else in the world and now they have been concerned about the rise of asia now we are being called uh, we're hearing this asian century they want to disrupt that okay uh, so that uh, the u.s can maintain its hegemony. all right this question was for um professor laris oh, sorry, professor sorry. laris yes please go ahead yeah, yes no, uh, talking and uh, talking to each other can i just uh, say something uh, uh, talking to each other is of course always a good idea but what would happen if the chinese uh, military rammed a philippine boat and it went down would that be into uh, interpreted as a uh, armed attack on the philippines so why now, why would the philippine boat do, be it's going it's there that situation to get, to get can you please continue without you interfering this situation uh, you needs interfered. To be you are prevented. the one who interfered. This is, the question was addressed. Mr. To me. Laurel, Mr. Laurel, there please. Yeah, please. There is a defense treaty between the yeah, Philippines and the United States. Of course, the United States doesn't want to invoke that defense treaty. It is warning repeatedly for China to be very careful what it does so that that defense right. treaty doesn't need to be invoked so that no counter action needs to be taken. This is meant as a good warning. It is not meant as an aggressive action. And I think we should oh. see how dangerous the situation is and try to de-escalate okay. on all sides, including all right. on the side of China. And okay. So the, yeah, uh, Ms. Uh, Professor Lawrence, I'm blockade. really running out of time. I have to block you here because I have two more guests. I want to leave some time before we, the show wrap up. Um, Ina, what is your reaction? Give it within 30 seconds, please. Well, I totally disagree. I mean, uh, you know, these, these are, as I said, State Department talk points uh, aimed at somehow convincing the world that China is at fault. If there's any bully in the world, it's the United States. Uh, you know, they go to stand alongside Ukraine. They're standing alongside Gaza. They, they did wonderful things in Afghanistan. Iraq is a, a, a mecca now because of what they've done. All right. Uh, Yan Yan, uh, how is China going to react if it believes that there is this intention to drag China into this com unnecessary conflict? I think, first of all, the Philippines needs to exercise more self-restraint in terms of our disappearance in the South China Sea. And secondly, for the United States, we do see a report released last week about the United States increase largely its military act activities in the South China Sea, which I think is a strategic deterrence to China, uh, which I think uh, everybody should be uh, paying more attention to. And thirdly, I think um, I really hope that the BCM, the communication mechanisms and also the hotline between the Coast Guards between China and the Philippines should go in, should, should keep going and resume. All right. We are going to leave it there. Many thanks to my guest, uh, Yang Yang, Director of the Research Center of Oceans Law and Policy at the National Institute for South China Sea Studies, Ina Tangan, Senior Fellow at Taiha Institute, Klaus Laris, a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center, and uh, Richard uh, M. Krasno, Distinguished Professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and Herman Till Laurel, President of the think tank Asian Century Philippines Strategic Studies Institute. Thank you so much. And with that, we come to the end of this special edition of The Point with me. Liu Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Liu Xin in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team, thank you for watching. You've got the point.